distinguished audience and circle of friends. I greatly regret not being able to join you in Oporto, surely one of the most beautiful cities in all the world. I have been here before. The purpose of my first visit in June 1984 was to give a lecture on the surgical management of cirrhosis and its complications. In January 1995, I returned to receive an honorary doctorate degree from your university, along with my old friend, Henri Bismuth. By then, I already had been retired from clinical surgery for five years. Now, 20 years further on, I can view from a quarter century retrospective the remarkable accomplishments in hepatobiliary pancreatic surgery. My own role in laying the groundwork of the new field began in 1956 with questions about the liver's double blood supply. The specific issue at first was whether portal venous blood had qualities that were important for optimal liver function and overall metabolic homeostasis. This question had been a subject of periodic debate for nearly 80 years, largely because of the confusing literature generated by experimental and clinical studies of portocable shunt, also known as ex fistula. In 1955, the controversy resurfaced in a new context, namely the auxiliary liver transplant model described in dogs by C. Stuart Welch at Albany Medical College in New York. In figure one of the handout that hopefully has been distributed to the audience, Welch's operation is seen on the reader's far left. With Welch's procedure, the double blood supply of the native liver was left untouched, while an extra liver, an allograft, was re-arterialized and provided with a high volume of portal venous inflow from an alternative source. The alternative source of portal blood was the inferior vena cable return from the dog's lower body and hind legs. When the transplanted hepatic allografts promptly shrank to almost half size despite their high volume blood supply, the acute atrophy was attributed by Welch to immunologic rejection. I was a surgical resident at the time. Based on my spare time studies of canine porticable shunt, during 1956 and 1957, my explanation for the atrophy was that Welch's auxiliary allografts had been deprived of liver supporting factors in the portal blood that had been completely removed by their primary passage through the native liver. The foremost candidate factor was endogenous insulin. To test my hypothesis, I developed two more procedures during 1958 and 1959. One was simple liver replacement, as shown in the middle image of figure one in your handout. The third operation on the right of figure one was called multivisceral transplantation. It consisted of replacement of the liver plus all of the other intra-abdominal organs. The three models in combination fueled two avenues of research and development. The first investigative pathway concerned the cross-regulation of the different abdominal organs. Ultimately, it was demonstrated that insulin and other molecules in portal blood play a crucial role in the control of liver size, ultrastructure, function, and the capacity for regeneration. These discoveries contributed importantly to the scientific base of liver transplantation while fostering fundamental non-transplant research that continues to the present day in regenerative medicine and intermediary metabolism. It goes without saying that the second developmental pathway led directly to human liver transplantation. At first, liver transplantation appeared to be an exercise in folly. At the dawn of 1958, no organ allograft of any kind had ever been transplanted in any species with survival of more than 28 days. Yet in the next five years, our observations with the combined use of azathioprine and prednisone at the University of Colorado had made kidney transplantation a clinical service 
and had brought the original objective of liver replacement within reach. When our first five hepatic recipients died within less than a month after their liver transplantation in 1963, further attempts at liver transplantation were delayed for four more years. Survival of hepatic recipients for at least one year was finally accomplished in 1967. Even then, the future of liver transplantation seemed bleak until the early 1980s. Nevertheless, I continued to do a small number of cases throughout the 1970s. The world's longest survivor, a child with biliary atresia, has now borne her transplanted liver for 45 years. Meanwhile, four new European centers were founded during this period in England, France, Germany, and Holland. Because survival never exceeded 50% in any of the five programs, liver transplantation continued to bear the label, feasible but impractical, until the introduction of cyclosporin by Roy Kahn in 1979, followed by our demonstration that the drug's optimal use required its combination with prednisone. At the end of December 1980, I moved from Colorado to, uh, to Pittsburgh, where the efficacy of cyclosporin-based treatment was established for all transplanted vital organs. On June 19, 1983, a consensus development conference for liver transplantation that included input from the four European centers concluded that liver transplantation had become a clinical service rather than an experimental procedure. The resulting worldwide stampede to develop liver transplant centers was even more dramatic than that of kidney transplantation uh, two decades earlier. Only six years later, a 17-page article divided between two October 1989 issues of the New England Journal of Medicine began with the statement that the conceptual appeal of liver transplantation is so great that the procedure may come to mind as a last resort for virtually every patient with lethal hepatic disease. Most of the legitimate indications for transplant candidacy were obvious, including inheritable disorders like Wilson's disease that had known biochemical explanations. In addition, liver transplantation as an instrument of clinical research received worldwide attention in 1984 with the case of Stormy Jones, a six-year-old child with congenital hyperlipoproteinemia, whose heart had been irreparably damaged by myocardial infarctions. The circumstances surrounding her combined liver and heart replacement and my rationale for proposing the drastic operation are described in the chapter, The Little Drummer Girls of my book, The Puzzle People. The revolution in all kinds of organ transplantation during the 1980s had been driven by cyclosporin. By the time of our 1989 two-part NEJM publication, however, our preclinical and clinical studies of tacrolimus, better known as FK506, already had led to its replacement of cyclosporin as the baseline immunosuppressant. The FK506 team leaders were John Fung and Saturo Toto. Further improvements in survival now were possible with the liver, kidney, and ultimately all kinds of organ transplantation. In addition, the multivisceral transplant procedures developed more than three decades earlier in dogs, as well as the transplantation of the intestine alone were elevated to the status of clinical service. The world's longest surviving multivisceral recipient, now a school teacher, is 24 years post-transplantation. Tacrolimus remains the baseline immunosuppressant of choice for all kinds of organ transplantation to the present day. By the 1990s, organ transplantation was widely acknowledged to be one of the most significant medical advances of all time. It also was one of the most enigmatic for more than 30 years, the unchallenged dogma had been that donor leukocyte chimerism played no role in organ alloengraftment. 
The consequence of this pervasive error was a never-ending search for chimerism-independent mechanisms of organ aloe engraftment. The futile exercise ended with our discovery in 1992 of a small population of multi-lineage donor leukocytes, so-called microchimerism, in all 30 surviving liver or kidney recipients in whom a search was done. There is no time here to explain how the microchimerism discoveries have necessitated a convulsive paradigm shift in transplantation immunology. Suffice it to say, this is all explained in a chapter of the fourth edition of the Busatil Clintmalm textbook, Liver Transplantation, that was launched only this week. Figure two of the handout is taken from that chapter. Because John Fung was a crucial member of the uh, chapter's authorship team, I am going to leave it to John to explain the mechanisms of organello and graftment and how this fresh insight can be applied to reduce or even eliminate the need for chronic exposure to toxic immunosuppression. Well, thank you for your attention and uh, 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 I hope very much uh, uh, that you uh, uh, get around and really see the town. If anyone wants more information, please go to the website uh, that serves uh, uh, my archives at uh, the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, the uh, address uh, is, on the, uh, uh, is on the handout. Thank you very much and uh, have a great time.